Well, here we are again, referring back for the third time in a row to this discussion about the science related to uh, painting. And um, <laughs> that's broadening out the subject quite a bit from anatomy, isn't it? But um, Antiguus got back to, uh, to us, and uh, I think this, it may have come to me personally. If it did, you're getting big segments of what he sent, but it was a big uh, response back that was much cl very clarifying and uh, demonstrated that we have l larger areas of agreement than disagreement. Uh, and I wasn't looking for an opportunity to, to disagree with somebody. I just like talking about these points, these ideas related to our field. So... Uh, so we're following up on the idea of, uh, of seeing, the importance of seeing as, a, as the primary science, the most important thing you have to learn. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, let's just look at this. Do you think Ang couldn't see? Uh, my comment, by the way, um, I don't mind. This is a rather, you know, do you think Ang couldn't see? It sounds pretty aggressive. <laughs> uh, I bet he could as well as any impressionist. But his choice of rendering is mainly based on form, not a visual impression. Uh, it's just different schools of thought. You can draw and copy everything without any scientific knowledge, I agree. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't even think that, by the way. So I want you to understand, I don't, scientific knowledge, I mean, we wouldn't, painting would never have advanced if it weren't for knowledge. And I mean, and I'm talking about sound knowledge. Uh, my personal painting would not have advanced without scientific knowledge, which is, for example, this, the idea that color is broken down into, uh, you know, the, the, for our purposes, and even the Munzel sort of analysis, but for our purposes, is, it has got to be broken down into uh, uh, values, intensity, or saturation, or chroma, and the, and the hue, the red, yellow, or blue part. And you can't correct a color note without doing that, so that you could call that an advancement in the, in the, in the science, right? So no, there's no such thing without any solid, I don't think that you can do anything without knowledge, not better than people in the past. So that what they've done, even when people are contributing one little thing at a time, uh, they are, that element they're contributing adds to the science, right? And this is, if anything, if nothing else, I mean, the science, this is a search for truth. Um, in the long run, we find it to be a search for uh, retinal truth, for the ability to 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 capture on a piece of canvas that which is is in 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 significant ways in the most or in most ways happening to your retina and then using those things as the basis of your edu of your of your work uh, which is the main reason I have for for suggesting that uh, impressionism not meaning broken color and bad drawing but the but working uh, being able to paint what you see with authority and, and, and accuracy is the fundamental thing that everybody must learn how to do. It's more important than anatomy. So that that's what we call the science of appearances. Some people call the science of appearances, ocular science, retinal science. Sargent used the word retinal. Um, let's go through this again. Do you think Ang couldn't see? I bet he could see as well as any impressionist. But his choice of rendering is mainly based on form, not a visual impression. It's just different schools of thought. You can draw and copy everything without any scientific knowledge. I don't agree with that. But, but there's a quote from Michelangelo, and he said a painter paints with his brains. You can't just judge him based on naturalism. Okay, now we're talking style. And here he's using that expression. He says he had a style akin to the Greek idea, and certainly he was informed by the Venus when doing his statues. Even if he used a woman as a model, he was after monumentality, which justifies that. The grand manner based on based and informed by sculpture. So let's just go and talk about Ang. Could Ang see? I'm going to show you whether or not Ang could see. So I, Degas said, I'm an impressionist in line. So he was a, he was a very, very much a follower of Ang and consulted, had consulted with Ang, and I think he had met with him more than once, but didn't study with him for unknown reasons. But he, for, for me, unknown. Uh, I, somebody may know why he didn't. But what you're looking at, when somebody says I'm an impressionist with line, what does it mean, right? What were people before that, right? So when I take what, when Degas says he's an impressionist in line, he's doing exactly what Monet was doing. He's trying to, he's trying to fully express the truth via line, right? So, so this capturing of the entire sort of, or, or the, not just entire, but the but the um, uh, 
the truth of what's sitting in front of you. Just leave it like that. Just the truth of what's sitting there, without adjustment through an idea, through a through a prism of an idea like idealization that was just referred to. Uh, so what you're looking at here is three drawings up the upper left by by Degas, each of which uh, situate you know among themselves. If he did nothing else, he would have situated himself as one of the great draftsmen of all time, which he is. And, of course, several people use different words for that. When you look at Daumier and say he was a great master draftsman, do you mean the same thing? Well, we can talk that way for some time. Ang is considered, Degas, Michelangelo both, they're considered to be great draftsmen of all time. They're very much in that category, right? But, so what I want to show you on the right, though, is two examples of Ang drawing that rather look like they're just drawn exactly the way they look. And he, by the way, he claimed that that's what he was doing which really sets up an interesting conversation, right? So this idea of uh, a little bit later, uh, I, wonder if I, can re I wonder if I can save that for a little bit later, but the idea, the idea that what's informing you, you know, they say the old expression or the American expression, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> this, whatever you're filling yourself up with, if you're filling yourself up with the Greeks and the Romans and the greatest of this and the greatest of that, uh, what comes out of you is gonna have the influence of those things, right? Now, uh, Antigius makes a really good point. It doesn't make any difference <laughs> whether you're conscious of it or not. It does have an effect on you. So, but let's just look ahead for Ang. So here's Ang and his influences, right? Now, I'm sorry these drawings can't be printed any better. I wish we could, somebody could figure out a way to get that one uh, from the Met. I think this is the only one from the Met here. Uh, but this is one of my favorite, historically, it was one of my favorite paint drawings, you know, in the class of, of all time, right? Um, but once you get to know David, you see mannerisms, you see Davidianisms in all of, of, of uh, Ang's drawings. You see the heavy influence of that guy. And um, his analysis, the joints and the rollers in terms of talking about the anatomy, you know, that, it, that stuff shows up when you're looking at Ang's work. Uh, it, even, for example, and if I can see it, the arm up here, that, sens I, that sensitivity toward joints and rollers rather overexpressed and, and in some ways not seen as well as if you hadn't had that idea in your head. But so, so Ang has the Greeks and the Romans. He has, he has lots of other history, but Etruscans. I mean, one of, it's a beautiful drawing by him. What is it in? The St. Symphorian, I think. But, but parts of the drawings for that look like they were taken from Etruscan sculpture. Uh, and of course, when you're doing a subject that's Greek, of course you're going to look Greek. And uh, so that, that, that picture, that figure there, and it's not one of the most extreme cases, is, is Ang, you know, looking Greek. This one, I would say, well, it was also done for a Greek subject. So, you know, and I consider that Ang was one of the great uh, idealizers. You know what I'm saying? Now, ideal means you, you, you're painting to the Greek look. And if you look at his, as I said before, I think in one of the previous ones, if you look at his work, so, some of the harem work, it looks Persian. It really is remarkable. Uh, he's got a phenomenally interesting feeling for that. Uh, so just giving you the background. So this stuff is what's, what he's full of. And he doesn't have, in my view, he doesn't mostly have, and you could argue this is because of the pictures he's working on. I understand that. But he doesn't seem to have the liberty to paint just what he sees as an impressionist in line. And, uh, and yeah, can he do it? Well, I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy like that. It looks like he's doing it right here. Uh, so I don't have any doubt whatever that he could do it. But um, how much he did it, you know, was undoubtedly related to what the work was that he was hired for. Uh, so there. And so let's go back, just look at the quote, the question for a second. So, so this question of style, you know, so Michelangelo had a style and all that sort of thing. It sets up a really big problem, right? And that is... The training of the painter should have, in my view, nothing but my view, it should have no style. The training of the painter should, should be style-less. The only style should be the authority of nature, the truth of nature in front of you. Now, I don't tell you that's art. And a lot of people just start getting confused when they see, and he mentions the, the, new, the, the new realism training uh, and how boring it is because it's just literalism. Well, it's judging it by the wrong and I'm not defending it one way or the other, but I'm, he's judging it by the wrong standard. Art is, let's say, the production that we call art, the, that successful thing called art, 
uh, is, is, needs to be separated from the study of nature. It needs to be clearly understood that we don't mean the same thing. So you don't judge a guy who's basically, he's trying to make something called art, but he's basically just copying what's in front of him because he's very young and hasn't got any idea of the rest of the story. You don't fault that. But any more than you fault an impressionist for not being a Greek, a painter of Greek subjects or something like that, the guy's theme is actually the beauty of what he sees in front of him. The Boston School is incorporated or fully invested in that. So keep that in mind. You're enough to know whether you're talking about art or the study of nature, right? And they're very different categories. So uh, you don't teach style in school. Ideally, you don't teach anything like style in school. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, <laughs> Ang's very funny because I saw at one point uh, uh, four figures drawn from life. Uh, five figures, actually. There, I think there were in a, 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 a um, oh, an old Beaux Arts uh, 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 magazine or something like that. I saw it at the uh, Athenaeum in Boston when I was there. Could never find it again when I went back to look for it. But uh, but it was five figures done in Ang's class, and they were progressively. I don't know if they're by the same guy, but I think they might have been. But but the first one looked very much like well, like the Degas I was just showing you. The second one looked like that, getting better, and the third one all of a sudden started shifting. And by the time you got to the fifth one, you had Ang. You had a Greek a Greek style, and so he had actually gone from teaching you nature to teaching you style. So there's no saying you you can't be taught somebody's style or how to, shall we say, to understand the Greeks. The best way to understand any of these people is to copy them. And uh, one of the things I wanted to show you is uh, is uh, the stuff that was influencing Michelangelo. He's a big fan of the Laocoon. These left two are Michelangelo. The top one on the right is Laocoon. Uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, you Greeks will be can be upset with me. And the second part here are the other figures that were commonplace, that were known to be around Rome, were um, uh, uh, the Belvedere torso, the one in the upper left, and uh, and that the has is apparently signed by Apollonius. So the, these are all Greek figures. Uh, this is the river god. Don't know. I don't recall who did that. But uh, but these this this Michelangelo copied. So Michelangelo is filling him up. Oh, I assume he copied this too, although I can't say I've seen the study for it, you know, any of the drawings. But the evidence is there, right? It's pretty strong that he did that. Uh, and uh, so in, the, in a sense, the, when you're doing a monument, you're always looking for the man instead of men, right? When you're an impressionist, you're looking for the man, not mankind. So they're a way different way of thinking about the figure at that point. And then you get down uh, to here and you have the Michelangelo Don, and you can see what he's doing is very, very akin to this kind of thing. Maybe, maybe hyper, maybe slightly exaggerated. Maybe, maybe these things actually look more true. A muscle, you know, muscle builder, a bodybuilder, you know, a farm worker, whatever, would produce your muscles in the old days like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, this does take on a certain exaggeration that I can see why Da Vinci would sort of have ridicule for aspects of it. But this is, um, but this is in that same sense, the search for what would I would suggest to you as rather an ideal figure. And uh, he's doing the Libyan Sybil, you know, some prophet, that, you know, is representing, you know, um, an idea. And of course, there we're talking about ideal in another way. So understand these influences were all over him. You know, he didn't have he didn't have classes in drawing accurately. Michel uh, da Vinci was developing that for his students, where he would have them draw from nature. And some of those drawings are very modern looking in the sense of almost being like uh, impressionist likenesses. I mean, in the Degas sense of drawing an impressionist line. Look them up if you haven't seen them. So let's just go past that. Uh, a true painter would paint just as he sees without any theory, would he? Well, I think everybody's always working from theory, um, but I don't think, I think that's a new thought here and I don't really want to talk about theory. Uh, so I don't know what that means unless you mean school, coming from a different school or something. Uh, but that's again where I would go back and say, look, whatever you load yourself up with is what's going to be in you. So all the sciences, you should consider what you want to know, <laughs> what you want to come out. I mean, if you want to be a well-balanced painter, you need to understand um, how paint is mixed, you know, what, when you understand what, what the, the, what the, uh, uh, the three primary colors and, and the secondary colors can do when they're in the mixing world and realize you can mix anything from them, 
That's, a ma that's an important thing to understand because it gets you back to a simpler palette. It gets you away from 800 dumb colors you don't even need. I tried the other day to use a, a sap green in a painting. <laughs> I, was trying, I tried to do a shortcut. And I said, you know, I can't quite hit the warmness of this note. I've, it's giving me a problem, and, um, which is funny. But I, I, I've never resorted to another color before, but it reminded me of one. I, so I thought I'd pull an experiment, and I pulled out this now, earth green and a sap green, right? They both have this interesting warm content. And I put them out there, and they wouldn't do anything. They were only good at that thing they did right there on the spot. And then they got dumbed down with white or with black. They, but they had no mixing quality. They, you couldn't do anything, <laughs> you know, to get those things to help another color. So uh, it was a very curious experiment. But really uh, confirming again what I've said is that you need to understand how to mix the primary colors. And you can mix any color in the world. You can mix anything you need. There's no surprises. And, uh, and I, now, now I'll say, and, and when there is, you can resort to a different pigment of, for one day, for one use or something like that. But my palette's so simple. Uh, I think it's five colors. But it's not a limited palette. It's, it's, it gives me everything, everything I could possibly want. Uh, five, by the way, five colors plus black and white. Okay. So a true painter would just paint as he sees without any theory. Well, when, 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 the, when the, why then study any art or science if we paint or draw what we saw, right? But I'm saying again that the science of seeing is important science too. And I'm really trying to say it's the underlying science. You have to learn how to, how to understand what you're seeing and, and play through with the pigments until what you're seeing is actually happening in so many words on the canvas next to whatever it is you're painting. And uh, so, and that, he, he goes on to say, I, I highly doubt that my that, that houdan that I did could have been made without a basic understanding of anatomy that I claim. I, I actually wasn't claiming I didn't have any understanding of anatomy at that point. I didn't mean to. I'd, I'd been away from the Art Students League for over two years at that point. And, uh, and I did spend time drawing bones, as I said. So we all know that those things have an influence on you. And he's right about something else um, that... Let's see if he comes to this here. Hale said, drawing is a subconscious act, and it is when you master it. When you haven't, you draw consciously. Anatomy is the same. You do all those boring exercises, read books, but when you stand in front of the model, you just draw. The knowledge is there, and it shows without even thinking it. The same goes with Munzel, a system I'm beginning to explore because I'm highly painted intuitively, so I see changes in it. He's saying, help, he's saying helpful changes. Inevitably, you will. So no... Um, uh, Drawing, in my, for me, isn't a subconscious act, though. I mean, I don't just go out there and do this and do this. I actually know what I'm doing at all times, and I'm doing it consciously. Because you have to be able to, you have to conceptualize the shape if you're drawing a shape. You have to conceptualize uh, the relationship of any two points. If you're drawing two points in the relationship, you have to get a concept of it. You have to be constantly thinking. That's where you, you know, you, you can say, you know, I mean, if you're drawing unconsciously, you're drawing from what we call talent, right? And you do have to actually draw, from time to time, you actually have to draw rather freely just to see what you know. But there's no freedom in it. There's always thinking. There's really never a moment in which you're not thinking. And so um, it is true that in our way of talking about the Impressionists, you, they say what, you have to be out of your mind to be a painter. It means you have to be in your eyes. But you're not not thinking. You're thinking about the data, just all this stuff and how it relates to each other. That's your thinking, 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 thinking. And then you're actually practicing the art. Now, a lot of the art becomes second nature. That's say the things you then do with the brush and all those sorts of things. Ideally, you want to get past all that. What's the sergeant says? You want to get past all this thinking about the brush and worrying about how you're making your marks so that you can actually think about higher things. So there's always thinking, right? Uh, so... I would say I've never, I don't draw unconsciously because I'm horrified of what I'll do if I do. <laughs> but I don't, but I don't think things in the sense of, of trying to figure out what I'm seeing. Figure out, figure out what it is, go back into my eyes, behind my eyes. I always tell students, you know, don't look, if you're, if you're, if you're not seeing what's in front of you every minute you're out there, then you're behind your eyes, you're in your ears, you're in, you're in your thoughts. That isn't the place where you want to be. You want to be thinking about the data in front of you, right? Okay. So, yeah, so that's, that's that. And then he goes on with one more. If you can't see it first, you won't know it. And that's the one we were beginning to talk about earlier. So if you can't see it first, you won't know it. That I rather, rather agree with, right? And I, he means it anatomically in three other ways. But 
the fact is, I didn't understand values for some long time. Finally, someone, someone said values to me, and I said, what? <laughs> you know, well, I had given a word to something I was, sort of was trying to do, which is find out where the dark is dark and light is light's word, but it was, it's helpful to have a name for it. So the first part of my training with students is actually what I call naming. I say the Dutch, I quote a Dutch, I mean, a, 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 a German, uh, there's a German axiom or whatever it's called, expression, you have to name the pig. And uh, so what I am, there's, there's a classic naming and students have to get to where they understand what it is we're talking about because they would have been out there thinking they're going to make some happy pictures, but they've actually never found the difference between the red, the yellow, or the blue, or the idea of, of chroma versus value. So, yeah, um, so you, you have to have been introduced to these things without any question. Uh, and it's not, un, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing if you've been introduced to concepts about the figure, uh, about anatomical ideas and stuff like that. It's not a bad thing if you've heard about proportions of the figure. Uh, as long as you know how to separate what you've heard in, in that world from that, what I now we can call theoretical world, from the actual world, uh, you know. So, yeah, there's value to the sort of the what do they call those uh, uh, rules of thumb and those sorts of things. But but the value is fairly limited. Look, the the idea of three proportion, the idea of threes with the with relation to the brow, the the I'm sorry, the widow's peak, the brow, and the base of the nose. That's a useful thing to know. But I wouldn't live by it. You know, you really wouldn't. <laughs> you have to know how much and exactly where we mean, or you wind up with something a little more generic than you might want in terms of a portrait. So then he says, no matter how much knowledge one has, a painter works with his hands, mind, and eyes, and ultimately with his soul, heart, whatever you want to call it. It's what makes a poet, not just a visual reporter, as this new realism tends to veer towards very boring. And again, I'll say to you, talk about the new realism that way. Talk about us as Impressionists that way because we're painting... In that, what you're training a student to do is hit the note, the note that he sees and the relationships of the notes and get them right. Doesn't mean it's art, so, uh, but it is the base of the entire art, okay? So if you don't forget that, if you do forget that, you'll be full of a certain spirit. I sometimes think of Watts that way. I think of him as a little bit of an unfortunate soul. He had some sort of amazing ideas, very poetic ideas, but his means of expression were inferior to a lot of his, a lot of his, um, uh, uh, fellow guys, and I think it's because of his his over uh, 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 working the idea that he was going to get there by a wonderful idea. So yeah, you, you, the mastery of our I mean, and again, don't ever forget what we're really talking is the mastery of the visual world because the beauty is in the visual. It's in the visual component. So if you're talking about a guy like Michelangelo, it's form play, right? I mean, admit it, you know, or it's the Greeks, the proportion is a huge factor. All sorts of things like go on like this. For the Boston School, it's light. But you're talking about the play of visual data, visual stuff, not, not simply a storytelling thing as much as that may please you, right? What makes you successful as a musician is the, it's what you, it's the sound, right? It's sound. And, I, and we're in a slightly different um, uh, world, but the arts being what they are, you know, and you can say that about dance versus uh, versus uh, uh, painting. It's a it's a motion. It's a pattern shape motion game, right? And it's not beautiful because of what what it is you're saying is beautiful because it's beautiful to look at. All right. So get your base right. In other words, be a master. Study the science, all these sciences. Enjoy yourself, but be a master also of the visual. And more than anything else, because it's required to get any of the other things you want, be a master of the visual impression. Okay, that's my cheap two cents worth, all right? See you next time. Do, do, do uh, let people know, uh, if you don't mind, uh, share, uh, uh, comment, and, and subscribe. Thank you very much.